Hi, everyone. Um, OK, so this lesson is on 6.5, which is about uh, regulation of, of enzymes and thus regulation of chemical reactions in your metabolism. Um, and what I want to do is actually start with the end of 6.4, where I introduced enzymes in the first place, because at the end of 6.4, they begin talking about regulation. Um, by introducing the concept of cofactors. So cofactors, like enzymes, are chemicals that participate in a chemical reaction but don't, aren't actually changed by it. But their job is not to lower the activation energy, which is the job of enzymes. Instead, what they do is modify the functionality of the enzyme. Um, so they're non-proteins. And they, they sort of come in inorganic and organic forms. And colloquially, we call those inorganic forms minerals and the organic forms um, vitamins. So uh, because most vitamins are organic forms of cofactors. In fact, the more formal name for an organic cofactor is a coenzyme. Um, and in a moment, I'll show you an illustration of how they function. Um, or not. So I'm going to show you something else. Um, we're actually going to see several of them over the course of this lesson. Um, okay, so one example of, of um, ways that molecules can interact with enzymes is in the form of inhibitors. So inhibitors don't help enzymes function, they get in the way of enzyme function. And inhibitors are a way that we can regulate the function of enzymes. They're also the ways poisons work. Many poisons interfere with enzyme function and thus ruin you in some specific way. Um, okay, so here are examples of inhibitors. Um, if you look just at part A here, what you see is an enzyme in purple and its normal substrate, which fits very nicely in this active site indicated here. Now in B, what you're going to see is um, a, an inhibitor that gets in the way of the substrate by literally binding to part of the active site, and thus making it impossible for the substrate and the enzyme to form a complex. This is called competitive inhibition because the substrate is competing with this little inhibitor for access to the active site. And that's one form of inhibition of enzymes. Another form is non-competitive inhibition, which is what's hidden here. Um, and non-competitive inhibition is a case where the substrate has no problem in getting to the active site, but the active site is misshapen by the binding of an inhibitor to another part of the enzyme, which results in a shape change of the molecule so that it no longer can bind to the substrate. So inhibitors can regulate the effectiveness of enzymes. They can turn enzymes off um, by their mere presence, and they limit the ability of enzymes to catalyze reactions by preventing them from binding to substrate. Um, what I neglected to mention was that enzymes are the subject of evolutionary change, as most molecules are in living systems. Um, they are encoded by genes, and uh, each uh, amino acid's position is determined by the sequence of the DNA. When the DNA sequence changes due to mutation, which is simply an accidental change in that sequence, um, it results in a change in the sequence of amino acids. And since you know that the, the tertiary structure of uh, amino acids acid polypeptides um, is influenced by the order of amino acids and the interacting R groups on them, um, it's no surprise that a single mutation may alter the, 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 the full shape of the enzyme and its uh, chemical properties so that these alterations can actually change how enzymes interact with molecules um, most of the time disabling their ability to interact with the molecules that they originally 
um, interacted with, sometimes improving that level of interaction and sometimes offering a novel interaction, uh, catalyzing a reaction that had never been catalyzed before. And so you might get new function, new chemicals in your body in areas and so new abilities. So all of those can happen um, to enzymes because of simple changes in DNA sequence. How that happens is the subject of a different unit. Okay, so what I want to do now is delve a little more deeply into how uh, enzyme activity can be regulated to control metabolism. Because of course, if it isn't regulated, then metabolism is control and you end up having spontaneous reactions when you shouldn't um, and not having non-spontaneous reactions when you should. And the result is you end up as a pile of goo. Um, and no one wants to be a pile of goo. So let's simply rejoice that there are all these mechanisms for enzyme regulation. All right. One, another way that enzymes are regulated um, through, uh, is through changes in their shape. Um, and that's what allosteric means. So allo means other and steric refers to shape. So by regulating the shape of enzymes, we can regulate um, their functionality. Now, um, I've just taught you about inhibitory allosteric regulation. Um, but there is also allosteric regulation that can improve the function of enzymes. And so I'm going to use some examples um, to show how that works. Okay, so most enzymes that are regulated in this way actually are made up of several polypeptides, quaternary structure, um, and each subunit is... Um, a single unit of catalytic activity, which is to say that um, there are several places on this quaternary sized pe um, protein uh, where there are active sites. And so, so several reactions can be catalyzed. Um, and furthermore, another feature of enzymes that are allosterically regulated is that they have both active and inactive forms. So they can shift in shape in a way that either activates or inactivates them. And the basic concept is this, that there are molecules that can stabilize the active form, and we call those activators, and there are molecules that can stabilize the inactive form, and we call those inhibitors. All right, so here is what activators might look like and inhibitors. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Okay, start here. Okay, and then the next place you're going to look is down here. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a, a protein enzyme with four subunits, each one with a little active site. And this particular drawing illustrates the enzyme with its four subunits in their active conformation, which is to say that the active site is just right for catalyzing a reaction here. All right. However, it oscillates between this active form and, now looking down here, this inactive form, which alters the active site in such a way that can no, it can no longer bind to substrate. Okay, and this oscillation is a feature of enzymes that are re regulated allosterically. Okay, so here we have a new molecule, an activator, that could be a protein, could be substrate, could be um, some other non-protein chemical. And it can bind to this enzyme in such a way as to prevent further oscillation and thus stabilize the active form of this enzyme. Similarly, there are molecules that can bind to the inactive form and stabilize it, and those would be inhibitory in their uh, regulatory function. So activators and inhibitors to allosterically regulated enzymes simply prevent the enzyme from oscillating from active to inactive forms and stabilizes one of those two forms. Cooperativity is a specific example of allosteric regulation. 
And it is where the, uh, the regulatory molecule that, that influences the function of the enzyme is the, either the product or the reactant of the reaction that is catalyzed by that enzyme. Right. So, for ex example, here we have some substrate that interacts with the enzyme to, um, uh, to become product. And when it binds to the enzyme, it causes the stabilization of that active form so that it is easier for the next bit of substrate to bind. So once a little substrate binds to the enzyme, more substrate will bind. That is cooperativity. It is a, a form of making the uh, enzyme action particularly efficient when there is a lot of substrate around. Okay. I've mentioned feedback inhibition before, and there are going to be lots of examples of feedback inhibition throughout the course, and it's probably worth your while to keep a running list of examples. Um, that might meet your needs when the time comes to take the AP exam. In other words, it's one of the um, overarching patterns we see in living systems is that they are regulated in a loop called feedback inhibition. Now, when talking about enzymes, um, the example looks a little bit like this. Um, so this is an example that involves two different amino acids. One is called isoleucine and another is called threonine. They're two of the 20 different amino acids in living systems. And we use them to build proteins of all sorts of kinds, but we have to actually make these um, or eat them in our diets. And it turns out that isoleucine is one that we can make using a metabolic pathway starting with the reactant called threonine. So threonine can be converted to isoleucine through a series of enzyme catalyzed intermediates. All right, so here's the metabolic pathway summarized. And in purple is our enzyme that catalyzes the first reaction. So here you have that first reaction, threonine is the substrate for that reaction. It becomes intermediate A, then is catalyzed to become B, to C, to D, and finally after five enzymes later, we have the catalyzed uh, product of this pathway, which is isoleucine. Now here is where feedback inhibition plays a role. Isoleucine binds to the enzyme that is the first enzyme in this pathway. And when it does, it alters the active site. Now I'm going to ask you this, this little question, and I'm not going to answer it here, but you should know the answer based on the lesson you've just had, which is, would you call this a competitive or a non-competitive inhibitor, given its arrangement in this diagram? I'll let you work that one out. OK. Anyway, the fact is that once this has bound allosterically to the enzyme, the enzyme can no longer bind threonine, which means that the pathway shuts down as the product accumulates. That's why it's called negative inhibition, is that we do less once we have more. So the more there is of this, the less the cycle happens. The less there is of this, the more the cycle happens. Right. So what happens is you end up having a sort of a regular supply of isoleucine because you can never have too much because the whole pathway shuts down when there's a lot or not enough because the whole pathway starts up again once there isn't any around. Okay. There are other ways that cells regulate uh, the metabolism through regulating enzyme function. And one of them is arguably one of the important diversification moments in the history of life. 
and that is the existence of organelles in eukaryotic cells. Um, we think that organelles are there because they help organize enzymes within the cell and by sort of packaging cooperating enzymes that don't compete with each other for substrate um, or for local conditions, um, we, you get more efficient me metabolic processes or, and more diverse because you can do more things if you have more packages to, to do them in. So there we, the, the very existence of compartmentalization within cells in the form of little uh, vesicles and vacuoles and so on um, probably is uh, an important evolutionary mechanism of regulation of enzyme function. Um, and then, of course, one example is the mitochondrion, um, where, which is a package <laughs> in the cell um, where all the enzymes related to the metabolic pathway called cellular respiration occur. And cellular respiration, I believe, is the subject of our next chapter. So with that, I think I'm going to leave you with a pretty picture of uh, the mitochondrion and call this chapter finished.